This is Denise Evans with Butler Evans Education. This video is about illegal tax sale redemptions, part one. It's part one because there are several different ways that an illegal tax sale redemption can take place. Each one of these parts will talk about the different ways and then give you the solution for that particular type of illegal tax sale redemption. Here is the problem. Um, in all counties that still do tax certificate sales as opposed to tax lien sales, the tax sale investor who successfully gains lawful possession of the property is allowed to make preservation improvements if the property contains a residential structure and is also allowed to obtain casualty insurance premiums. And if the taxpayer owner wants to redeem, in addition to the taxes plus interest, the taxpayer will have to pay the value of the preservation improvements and will have to reimburse the investor for the casualty insurance premiums. And all of those things, the taxes, the preservation improvements, and the insurance premiums all bear interest at 12% per annum interest. The problem comes about because when the property owner goes to the county clerk to redeem, the county clerk knows what the taxes are and they can calculate the interest, but the county clerk does not know if the investor has made any preservation improvements or obtained insurance and they don't know what the number is. Despite that, in an Alabama Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court said that it was the redemption office's responsibility to find out those items and not let the uh, taxpayer redeem until they had paid those charges. To meet those obligations, the counties have come up with something called the affidavit system. And how this works is the taxpayer will go down and say, I want to redeem my property. This is the parcel ID number. This is my name. And the redemption clerk will give the taxpayer the amount of the taxes plus the interest and will also give them an affidavit to be sent to the current owner of the tax certificate rights. That affidavit calls for the investor to sign the affidavit certifying that the taxpayer does not owe any additional money to the investor. This could come about because the investor did not make any preservation improvements and did not buy casualty insurance. If that is the case, the investor would sign off and the taxpayer would take the affidavit back to the county and the county would let them redeem for the taxes and the interest. Or perhaps the investor has indeed made preservation improvements, but um, disclose that number to the taxpayer and the taxpayer either paid that amount or an agreed upon amount. And as a result, at the end of the process, no additional money is owed to the investor. And so the investor signs the affidavit. Um, or the investor and the taxpayer get in a battle about the value of the preservation improvements and it's never resolved or it drags on for a long time or they go to court. Whatever happens, the investor refuses to sign the affidavit because once it signs the affidavit, then the redemption clerk will let the taxpayer redeem. So with all of that background, this is how the problem comes about. In the typical way this happens is taxpayer tells redemption clerk, I want to redeem. Redemption clerk gives taxpayer the affidavit we've just described and the taxpayer mails it to the investor by certified mail. The investor receives the affidavit and either um, emails or sends an answer by certified mail or texts or calls in some manner, contacts the taxpayer and says, I have made preservation improvements and so you're going to owe me 
X, let's just say $5,000 to make up a number, you're going to owe me $5,000 to redeem. The taxpayer is typically surprised at that, doesn't have the extra $5,000 or whatever, and doesn't know what to do. So they go back to the redemption clerk and they lie. They basically lie. I'm not saying all of them, but this happens a lot. The taxpayer lies and says, I mailed the affidavit to the investor. Here is the green card where they signed for it on this particular date, or they never signed for it, but I mailed it to their last known address as shown by your records. And it's been more than 10 days and they have ignored the affidavit. Please let me redeem. At that point, the redemption clerk will give the taxpayer another affidavit, a second affidavit. We're going to call this affidavit number two. And we're going to look at this in the next several slides. The top part of the affidavit um, says redemption affidavit information. That's the title. And it says this document certifies that the redemptioner has satisfied either one of the following requirements per the Code of Alabama, section 40-10-122. And you can put an X in either one of these choices. So the first one is, the redemptioner has made written demand upon the purchaser and the tax lien purchaser has failed to respond within 10 days of receipt of the verification or demand notice. That's going to be the most common one that people choose. Or the second choice is the tax lien purchaser has refused or failed to appoint a referee as provided in section 40-10-122 uh, subsection D. That's the referee and umpire process. But usually if a redeeming party, a redemptioner is going to lie about this, they're going to choose that first one and claim that they sent the certified letter to the investor and the investor has not respond, responded within 10 days of receipt. After that, the redeeming party has a part of the form where they fill in the parcel number, their name, address, city, state, zip, and a phone number, and then they sign. Either the owner signs or an authorized agent of the owner, typically if the owner is a corporation or an LLC. And if it's a company or an LLC or something like that, there's a space to fill in the name of whatever legal entity it is that's redeeming. Here's the meat of the coconut at the very bottom of this form. There's a box. And in that box, it says sworn to and subscribed before me on this the blank day of blank and then a blank for the year, a blank for a signature, notary public, my commission expires. In other words, if the redeeming taxpayer is going to lie and say that they sent the certified letter with the affidavit, um, the first affidavit, to the investor and the investor ignored them, it's not enough that they're lying on the form, they're lying under oath. That's what this notary box means. It's under oath. So the solution to the problem, if a taxpayer is allowed to redeem illegally because they lied about not getting a response from the investor, then the investor will need to file a petition. It's like a lawsuit. They'll file a petition with the probate judge and ask the probate judge to revoke the redemption certificate. In that petition, you need to know that before it was allowed to get that far, the redeeming party was required to, to sign this affidavit number two. So in that petition, you need to state that the uh, redeeming party's affidavit was false that the, the statements made in that affidavit were false and they were made falsely under oath. And so in your petition, 
Not only do you say that, which puts you on the high moral ground, which is important with a judge, but it also gives you a basis for saying, the only reason I'm here, Your Honor, having to spend legal fees to be in court, is because the redeeming party lied. And so on top of revoking the redemption certificate, I want you to make them pay for my legal fees. You should be sure to ask for that because it doesn't happen automatically. It might not happen anyway. The judge might decide you're not entitled to the legal fees, but if you don't ask for it, you will not get it. How do you take advantage of this information so you are prepared in case a taxpayer is successful in doing an illegal redemption? Number one, the original affidavit, the affidavit number one that the uh, redemption office gives to the taxpayer and tells the taxpayer to send to the investor, that affidavit is sent to the last known address of the currently assessed uh, tax certificate owner in the county files. So your job as the investor is to make sure that your name is in those records and there is an up-to-date, accurate uh, mailing address for certified letters to reach you. Be aware that if you use a mailing service, a mailbox service like uh, UPS offices or an office business center or someplace like that, if you use one of those services to receive your mail, you signed something when you started that relationship that said that they could accept mail on your behalf. And so if a certified letter arrives and they sign for it, that is the same as you signing for it, even if you get your mail only once a month or twice a month. So be aware of that and use a real address where you will get the certified letter. That's uh, point number one for being prepared. Point number two for being prepared is if you receive that affidavit number one from a redeeming taxpayer, your response stating that the taxpayer owes you additional money, if indeed they do, your response should be by certified and regular mail to the taxpayer. That way, if they lie, if they go back and they lie and said that you never responded and they are able to redeem by signing the second affidavit, you will have proof that you did not ignore the initial letter and you in fact responded in a timely way. It is very important to have that proof by the, the stamp certified mail letter that you send out back to the taxpayer as opposed to your proof just being you saying, yes, I did. And you're going to say, yes, I did. And the taxpayer is going to say, no, you didn't. And in a he said, she said, yes, I did, no, you didn't situation, it is extremely unlikely that a judge will award you legal fees. It is extremely unlikely that the judge will find that the taxpayer lied and might be more willing to say, well, maybe it was a mistake, maybe it got lost in the mail. So those are the two things that you need to do to be prepared. Make sure your name and your mailing address are accurate and up to date at the county records for, the, for whatever parcels you have tax certificates on. And number two, any response that you send to a request to sign affidavit number one, your response should be by certified mail and by regular mail. A lot of people don't sign for certified mail, but they always get the regular mail. So the certified mail is proof that you mailed it, but everybody's usually confident the regular mail one actually got through. As far as being prepared by knowing the whole dispute process with preservation improvements and referees and umpires and all of that, that is not covered in this video. That is, I have other materials on that, um, but that is not covered in this video. And we will end with the commercial. This is Denise Evans with Butler Evans Education. If you found this information useful, I have a lot more similar information on my website for tax sale investors 
at www.butlerevanseducation.com. And that information is on the final slide, so you can just get it off of there. Um, I have classes, live classes. I have videos. I have books. I've got free downloadable articles. And I also have a YouTube channel that you should follow so that you'll get notices of new content whenever I post a new, um, a new video with information about tax sale investing. Again, this is Denise Evans. All information is copyright protected. I am with Butler Evans Education at www.butler, B-U-T-L-E-R, like the butler did it. Evans, my last name. Education, spelled all the way out, E-D-U-C-A-T-I-O-N dot com, www.butlerevanseducation.com.